Good morning. Okay. Welcome to worship service at St. Matthew's United Church with Bloor Street United Church. My name is Alia El Menzi. I'm a visiting minister from Germany, and I'm co-leading the service today with Reverend Douglas Ducharme. Welcome to everybody on Zoom. It's nice to have you with us. Welcome to all of you in the sanctuary. Welcome all you saints. All you saints. Let it just sink in a moment. Whom do you think of when you hear the word saint? And to the people on Zoom, if you would like to share online, you can just put it in the chat. Whom do you think of? Saint. You know, just think a little bit in your heart whom you consider to be a saint. Today, music, prayer, reflection, and pictures will explore different kinds of saints. Take a deep breath and let go. Ground yourself in God's promise that you are welcome. You are welcome no matter where you are or who you are. You are welcome no matter what you believe or don't believe. You are welcome no matter what you're struggling with, no matter whom you love. You are welcome. Let us be aware of where we are at this very moment. There were people before us. There will be people after us. As we gather to worship, recognize we have sampled on land that is sacred, a traditional gathering place for many peoples of Turtle Island. To show respect for this long history, we acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of several indigenous nations and give special recognition to the Mississauga of the Credit. As we acknowledge this land, let us be mindful of making right all our relations. There once was someone who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people started to follow. But they didn't know who he was. And once, when they asked, he said, God, you held us in past days. Every stumble, every hesitant step, our confident strides, and our joyful dancing. We are here with our yesterday, the stories we lived. God, you hold us in present days. Every tear, every doubt, our achievements and our struggles. We are here with our today, the songs we sing. God, you will hold us every day of our life, every hope, every fear, our end of life and beyond. We are here with our future, the dreams we dream. God, you are here with us. This is your promise. Amen. Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. As followers of Jesus, the Messiah, we pass on the peace of God from one deep place in our heart to another. The peace of God be with you. Our first reading today, our responsive psalm, is Psalm 146. You will find it in Voices United, number 868, where the refrain is also found, and we'll begin by singing the refrain. I will 
will praise God. As long as I have life, I will sing praises to God. Put not your trust in princes, nor in any mortal, for in them there is no help. They breathe their last, they return to dust. Then their plans come to nothing. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in it, the one who keeps faith forever, who gives justice to the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Restore sight to the blind. God straightens those who are bent, loves those who are just. God cares for the stranger in the land and sustains the widow and orphan. But the way of the wicked God turns to ruin. God shall reign forever, O Zion, your God for all generations. Ruth tells the story of a family from Bethlehem who decides to leave for another country because of a famine. This is a story of refugees, of immigration, of loss, of women, of finding a home, not within another country, but with people. Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Melon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites, from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Melon and Kilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that God had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from that place where she had been living she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May God deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. God grant that you may find security each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you wait until they are grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, 
it, is, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of God has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpa kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you, to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May God do thus to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. In this reading, we hear God's voice. God is still speaking. Kindness and peace to you from God, our source, and our liberator, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a famine in Judah. Bethlehem, that's translated the house of bread, has no bread any longer. It has nothing to feed its people. And in the middle of this life-threatening event, a family, father, mother, and their two sons. The biblical story only needs one sentence to explain the circumstances. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went out to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Okay, one moment, that was way too fast. Everybody who had to leave their country because of economic, political, or other reasons might begin to wonder. The text skipped quite a bit here. You don't take such a decision in the blink of an eye. It is dark outside. Elimelech, Naomi, and their sons are sitting glumly together. Naomi's glance wanders from the empty jars to the heap of hay where the goat used to sleep. She hears her own stomach growl echoed from her son's hungry bellies. Elimelech clears his throat. I know this is a hard decision. There is no food left. Rumor has it Moab wasn't hit by the famine. We can survive there. It is only for a few months. Machlon, one of their sons, raises his voice. Abba, the people in Moab hate us. Did you forget how they plotted against us? How they hired Biliam to put a curse on us in the time of Moses? You can't be serious. The elders ruled against it specifically for this reason. Nobody will ever speak again to us. And Helion supports his brother. What about my engagement? I can't marry Sarah if our family is disgraced. What future do we have in Moab? Our laws forbid to marry Moabite women. Naomi listens to her husband and her sons. She can hear the fear, desperation, and confusion. Going away means risking so much without knowing if they will survive in Moab, if they have a future there. We know from the story that the family takes the risk. They are leaving their home to settle in a foreign country. Sometimes there's a crisis, and you need to decide if you stay or leave. You need to decide 
where your future might lie. In the story of a famine, this seems to be a non-negotiable reason, very clear. Abraham did so, and also Jacob and his family. But there are always options. This family is taking a risk. They don't know how the people in Moab will receive them. They don't know if they can't, can fend for themselves in this place. They don't know anybody. They need to start anew and without security of connections. And the story goes on, and it doesn't take long, and Elimelech dies. Can you imagine? The family managed to flee from the famine, settled in Moab, and then Elimelech dies. The whole situation changes. Naomi is a widow now with two sons, without a husband. And again, there are decisions to make. They could return so her sons can marry women from Bethlehem, build a family, have a future, secure the future of the whole family. But the famine is not over yet, and the months have become more and more. So, where lies hope and future? Machlon and Chilion marry Moabite women, despite their own traditions and religious laws. Again, the family is taking another risk. It is not easy, I imagine, to find women who want to marry somebody from Judah, but it works out. They find Ruth and Orpah. I imagine they all live together. Naomi, Chilion, Machlon, Ruth and Orpah. Building their relationships, getting to know each other, merging their different traditions having some differences every now and then. For sure, there were some struggles. People who live in families with different cultural and religious background for sure know a, thi know a thing or two about that. All in all, it worked out. The only sorrow was, for everybody, that there was no child yet. Ten years pass in a moment, and again, misfortune hits. Both Machlon and Chilion die. Another turn, and again, decisions need to be made. Laurie, would you be so kind to, to show us the first slide? Okay. So you can see on this picture three scenes from the story. On the first picture, there are the three women burying one of their men. In the background, you can see two other graves. On the second picture, it shows how Naomi and Ruth and Orpah are parting ways. They're walking in opposite directions. And on the last picture, you can see Ruth and Naomi embracing each other, holding each other. Thank you, Laurie. Naomi, Orpah and Ruth rest in the shadow of a tree without a husband, without children. Automatically, their hands reach for each other. Three graves, three widows, three women, grieving, shocked. Naomi can feel that the younger women are looking at her with so many questions in their eyes. Disbelief, pain, fear. She squeezes their hands. I heard that my God has finally answered our prayers. The famine is over. There is again bread in Bethlehem. God has provided food. I will go back. Naomi has made her decision, but she knows that her daughters-in-law are not yet ready. So they pack, decide what to take and what to leave. They don't talk much. Everything is a blur. Finally, they set out. Orp and Ruth follow Naomi, step by step. Naomi is trying to find the right words in her head. All three women are lost in their thoughts. So Orp and Ruth don't even notice that Naomi has brought them close to their homes and families. 
their mother-in-law, their friend, stops abruptly. Just picture for a moment these three women who lost so much, imagine their bond and connection to each other, sharing one another's grief, supporting each other, walking together through the highs and lows in their lives. Naomi's speech to her daughters-in-law is well thought through. She orders them to go back to their mother's houses. She doesn't ask or suggest. And she reminds them with her choice of words that their birth mothers are waiting for them. They have a family of origin to go back to. But Naomi is also aware of the conventions of her time. Her beloved fellow widows need a new husband, a man to give them security in a world where women were without any protection, without any man. But Naomi blesses them. May God deal kindly with you as you have dealt kindly with my sons and me. Naomi trusts in God after all she has gone through. Even though she is convinced God has turned against her, she entrusts her daughters-in-law to God's care and kindness. Can you believe it? And this goodbye is breaking their hearts. They cry and kiss each other. But the two younger women refuse to leave her. Obviously, Naomi needs stronger arguments. At length, she explains that staying with her means giving up hope for any future, any hope of a family. Who would stay under such circumstances? And so Orpa decides to leave her mother and sister, her chosen family. How hard it must have been to turn around and walk away. Orpa is often disregarded because she leaves for her home. But for me, this is a story of three courageous women, of women taking a risk to survive, of women investing in their relationships to secure their futures. But Ruth clings to Naomi, and the Hebrew uses even a stronger term. Ruth glues herself to Naomi, glues herself. She simply refuses to leave. And she takes an oath, an oath of loyalty people would usually take when they marry or pledge an alliance. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May God do thus to me and more as well, even if even death parts me from you. Quite an oath. Ruth puts her whole heart, her soul and being in this oath. And Naomi listens. A bond has been confirmed. A family has been chosen. Their love for each other becomes the basis for their future together. And what strikes me with Naomi is that she listens, how she listens, not in the conventional sense. I believe she listens with her heart. She listens for the future of her beloved daughters-in-law. She puts herself aside, fearless. She has a lot to lose. The only family she has left, the only emotional and physical support. At the same time, she's also willing to accept love and care being offered to her. How can we nurture this kind of listening in our congregations? Listening beyond our own interest, listening beyond our fears, listening in relationship to each other, curious and open for the story of the other person, welcoming their ideas, their insights, their experiences, caring for each other. I think the book of Ruth tells us at least where this listening comes from, love. And before you roll your eyes, let me please explain. You know, it's not again like, oh, it's about love again. Listen. This love between the women and in the relationships to their men is described with a very specific word in Hebrew. It's not the word for romantic love. 
The word used is chesed. Chesed. Chesed can be translated with different words in English. Here in our passage, it is kindly. Naomi says, may God deal kindly, chesed, with you, as you have dealt kindly, chesed, with my sons and me. And chesed describes God in the Jewish tradition. This is one characteristic of God, chesed. It can also be translated as steadfast love or commitment, as kindness or love. It is always a relational term. Because God relates to people in loving kindness, people can relate to each other in the same way. Chesed means caring and building together a good life. Naomi describes Orpah and Ruth, both of them, as being full of chesed. They have shown kindness, steadfast love and commitment toward her sons and her. And Ruth is acknowledged for her chesed throughout the whole book of Ruth. She lives the highest ethical value. God's chesed runs through her. Is that the hallmark of a saint? Laurie, could you please show us the second slide? You can see on this picture a hilly green landscape. And in the middle of it, thousands, millions of people with candles in their hand, stretching as far as the stars in the sky, merging even, I imagine, with the sky behind them. Thank you, Laurie. Ruth is tightly woven into the story of Israel. She is the mother of Obed, the grandfather of King David. And the Gospel of Matthew draws a direct line to Jesus. Imagine all these people, the generations before us. Ruth, everybody in there. Imagine yourself in their middle. Think of all the others to come behind you. No saints in the sense of perfect people, but all connected by chesed, by trying to build a good life together, letting God's chesed run through them. This week I asked around in the congregation, I asked, whom do you think of, like I did in the beginning, like I asked you, whom do you think of when you hear the word saint? And you know, it was so touching because so often people told me names of this congregation. And one answer stuck out for me. It's from Susan's mom. Susan's mom used to say, saints are people who let their light shine. Saints are people who let their light shine. So let your light shine. Amen. Go into the world with God's blessing. God bless you and keep you. God make their face shine upon you and be gracious to you. God turn their face toward you and give you peace. Amen.